2nd of April, 2024, uh, the secret police on uh, on here wouldn't allow this to be recorded, so I'm going to go ahead and record it like this. This is the news that they don't want you to know. And, uh, we'll just, uh, what am I looking for? This right here. Uh-huh. And this. Exposed Karine Jean-Pierre's shocking press conference. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Secular. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments. Or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan. Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. We are taking your phone calls, 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. You heard about the United States taking this abstention at the United Nations on a vote involving Israel. Now, I want to put this into context. Three times before, the U.S. voted uh, against this kind of resolution on Israel, calling for a ceasefire that doesn't condemn Hamas, nor does it require or even ask Hamas to turn and to give over the, the hostages that still remain, which is estimated around 100. Yeah. Some of those are alive. Some might be bodies. But it's still a very large number. And that was excluded from the language. So the U.S., the last three times, vetoed, voted against this. It didn't pass. But this time at the United Nations... The United States decided we'll go along with the language that doesn't include the hostages being released, that doesn't condemn Hamas and their acts of terrorism on October 7th that led to the conflict that is still ongoing. By doing so, this resolution moves forward. Now, a resolution from the Security Council is a step in the wrong direction against Israel. See, but what we're most concerned camera. about, and why we're watching it very carefully through our team, uh, both at ACLJ Jerusalem, our international team, our, NG, you know, our NGO status at the UN, is that the United States making these moves... Yeah politically over time, especially when it comes to the Biden administration and the left. And we can play for you because Karine Jean-Pierre was asked directly about it. It sounds like you're playing politics with this because you've now changed your policy, what, based on 18 to 29 year olds who are protesting at their college campuses? Take a listen. This is not about politics. It's not. The president does not lead his national security or things that are the right thing to do in this sense, right? Getting that hostage deal, making sure... Uh, the hostages come home, including, as I said, over and over again, American hostages getting that humanitarian aid into Gaza and making sure that it, it, we believe that would lead to a ceasefire. That is not about politics. It is about the right thing to do. But it, the right Logan, thing it, to not, do. the language doesn't include getting the hostages out. And it doesn't include uh, uh, Hamas, the, no condemnation of Hamas. All it does is say, if they get humanitarian aid in, maybe... Maybe then Hamas will do something good. And we've seen time over time, they've gotten humanitarian aid in this entire time, and they sell it or steal it. Yeah, we know where it's actually going. That's been a concern the entire time. 
And sure, I mean, maybe there's part of them going, you know what, we're not going to be able to get them to free uh, the hostages, so whatever, throw in the towel. But it's sad when this is the, the place we got to uh, in America where you're able to say, okay, let's take out all the all the rough language. What was the rough language? Uh, getting hostages out. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, this is a clear move by the Biden administration. Looking at uh, their poll numbers, which are not good in younger voters, where they typically, the left relies on... It's not just the college vote either, Logan, that we're talking about. We're talking, a lot of people say 18 to 29. I'd say it's more like 18 to 40, 18 to 39, really. And we've seen a shift uh, in yeah, uh, the Christian community. We've yeah. seen a shift amongst, uh, definitely on college campuses, getting more radical in support of, uh, and, and anti-Israel, but in support of Palestinian causes, regardless of the brutality of the attack on October 7th. Mm. It didn't take long for everybody to, to just forget October 7th and just focus on the fact that Israel, on Israel's response, as if they're just attacking Gaza for no for reason. No, for no reason. And I think you're right in that age demographic. I think it maybe even skews a little older, where you have people that are in college now. Like I said, maybe you know, up through adults. If you're on the left, yeah. essentially, you have to be. This is your talking point. You become that, anti-Israel. That's, part of that's the, your. Yeah. That's your part of your platform now. Yeah, and so I want to take your calls. That one eight hundred six eight four three one two. The fact that this used to be an issue that united Republican and Democrats. And now there's only a handful of Democrats left in both the House and the Senate that stand with Israel. There are a handful, but they are dwindling. We are going to be back. We would love to take some of your phone calls. I do have a couple lines open right now. So 1-800-684-3110. NGOs, non-government organizations like... The ECLJ, which is an accredited NGO at the United Nations, uh, can go and deliver a message based on whatever the topic that they are addressing is. They normally have an agenda item. So one of the agenda items is Pakistan. And so in that oral intervention, we're bringing up the persecution of our own client in Pakistan. That's one that we'll play for you tomorrow. But Israel, an agenda item, as happens to be often at the UN Human Rights Council, because they love to hate Israel at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, afforded us an opportunity to go there and speak uh, on behalf of defense of Israel. And so this is Sisi Heil in Geneva. Israel faced one of the worst attacks by Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist groups from the Gaza Strip. Over 1,200 Israelis were brutally killed, including men, women, children, infants, and the elderly. Women were raped and mutilated. Dead bodies were desecrated. The terrorists bragged about these atrocities. There's no doubt that Hamas's actions constituted crimes against humanity. This council must unequivocally condemn Hamas for its war crimes against Israel and affirm Israel's inherent right to self-defense. Really powerful stuff that's happening all around the world thanks to your support. I mean, really, that's all it is, is thanks to your support. We wouldn't be able to afford the travel alone. And the, that cost alone, as you know, someone who's probably traveled world, worldwide, you know that that is not something to take lightly. So we have to be able to do these things. We have to be able to work all over the world. We have to have offices in Israel, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have you know, satellite offices around the country and around the world. In Strasbourg, France, the uh, European Union, we are wherever we can be. We have a representation at the U.N. Whether you like it or like them or not, someone's got to be there for your voice. And we are really blessed to be able to do that. You know, I, I don't take that lightly at all. Welcome back uh, to Secular U.S. Overseas with the European Center for Law and Justice as we are doing our work uh, there, of course, continues on at the International uh, Board of Human Rights and also at the European Parliament. And you, you've probably, if you follow kind of conservative politics uh, in the U.S. and around the world, you've seen the rise of conservative politics all over Europe. So we're kind of, as we do with the U.S., preparing, like we have our team in D.C., we're preparing the team at the ECLJ working together on working with these new governments that have kind of been an unknown to, to Europe for the last uh, three or four decades uh, that share a lot of our views on, on issues of life, uh, on issues of support for Israel, on uh, economic issues, uh, democracy, voting, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Uh, so, uh, again, it's kind of this whole new world. And what we are seeing then, too, with, with our team at the U.N. is this 
able to ability to reach and put pressure on these countries like Pakistan. And you, we've talked about uh, the Shazad case in prison, on death row, and uh, Cece Hal, who was at the uh, in Geneva, of course, at the United Nations. Uh, so our team there was able to deliver an oral intervention at the Human Rights Council. Uh, these are on, on these are on video. You haven't seen this one yet. Uh, this is a new one, and we wanted to play it for you just to show you. With the ACLJ team is all over the world, active for the persecuted, active for Israel, active for you here in the United States with those 12 pending cases uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court, making sure you have the ability to vote for the candidate of your choice in that last Supreme Court uh, victory. Uh, but again, I want you to watch this or listen if you're listening to the show about what we're able to do at the U.N., in calling out Pakistan in front of all the ambassadors. Being the floor to the European Center for Law and Justice. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the treatment of minority women in Pakistan, their forced religious conversions and forced marriages, the ECLJ would like to commend Pakistan for recently adopting a bill raising the marriageable age for Christian girls from 13 to 16. Although that is a good step, it is still insufficient to fully protect these young Christian girls. The law should be consistent with the international standard, that is, anyone under 18 should not be allowed to marry. Additionally, with the new administration, we hope that Pakistan will finally take a serious look at the blasphemy cases in the country. The ECLJ's affiliate currently represents five innocent Christians in such cases. Shahzad Masih's and Amun Ayyub's cases have been brought before this council many times. We simply ask that the government establish mechanisms to sort out false accusations, stop prosecuting innocent people who face false allegations, and expedite cases that are pending. Amun Ayyub has spent over 10 years in prison. Shazad Masih has spent over six years in prison. We stand ready to work with the authorities to address these issues and work together to fulfill our obligations for justice and the protection of human rights. And as the Pakistani representative said yesterday, justice delayed is justice denied, and we agree. Thank you. And, and CC and our team have done a great job, Logan, because it's not only at the UN Human Rights Council, we have uh, the UN group on the arbitrary detention, uh, a number of these four or five special rapporteurs just on uh, the case involving uh, uh, involving Shazad. I think we're very close there. Of course, until they're released and released safely and securely, um, you have to assume that they are, their life is in danger. But that is what we're very close on. I want to remind people, too, Pastor Saw, who we were working on uh, for seven years, he's been imprisoned in China uh, for uh, distributing Bibles. Uh, we began representing him five years ago uh, when they, the family had kind of exhausted their domestic efforts. And ultimately, the ACLJ sticking with it, with our international team, he has been released. Uh, he has not yet been returned to the United States. And I don't know, we don't have any indication that he's got to the U.S. Embassy yet. So we want to be very careful in uh, not providing too much information about where he is. But I do want to let you know that he is out of prison. And that's an example, Logan, of, of, the, of the kind of work that we do that isn't, you know, over, over and done even within like a, a one term of a, pre, or of a president. I mean, it's seven years in the making, but it's worth it when you're talking about a human life. Yeah, absolutely. It is the work that the ACLJ does, whether you hear about it or not. I think it's important to know that a lot of things are happening behind the scenes. I know it's easy to say that, but it's just true. And when we were able to reveal facts like this, when you have a... Uh, Pastor Saw, who you may have heard about five years ago, and then you may have thought, oh, they just stopped talking about it. Well, there's reasons things get, sometimes you have to stop talking publicly because things are happening behind the scenes. And here's one of the proofs of that. He is free in the country, and we are doing what we can to get him back home uh, to his family. But again, long term, these are five, six, seven years, sometimes more, uh, in the making. It's what, And sadly, even in American law, that is sort of the process here. Not things don't work on a rapid, you know, speed way. A lot of things happen just by sticking to it, going with the process, and winning and losing and winning again. Do you want to take some phone calls? Absolutely. Let's go to uh, Joanne, who's calling in Ohio. Watch it on ACLJ.org, which we appreciate. You're on the air. Hi, guys. Um, real quick, I remember your father saying after Trump won that those last 90 days were when Obama was going to do his worst. So 
this kind of goes along the same thing of what you were saying. But that's not really why I called. I just want to acknowledge the passing of Joe Lieberman, a strong, staunch supporter of Israel, spoke out against Hamas. You know, I saw him a few days ago on Newsmax. I mean, this is such a tragedy. I mean, he's one of the few reasonable Democrats that were out there speaking truth. And I just think it needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously we you know, send our love and uh, prayers to Joe Lieberman's family. Uh, whether you agree with them or disagree with them on other topics, there were certain things, like a lot of old school Democrats, that we could agree with. And look, I would even though this is crazy, until... Chuck Schumer's weird turn against Netanyahu, Chuck Schumer was kind of one of those guys where you didn't agree with on almost anything, but was one of the leading voices in support of Israel when no one else was. Sadly, even he's been turned now, a Schumer, in, in that situation. You know, once was the voice of, like, the one thing he, we could agree with him on was his pretty much unwavering Zionism. Yes, and, and now... And if he disagreed with Israel, it would be behind the scenes. He wouldn't take a speech... Uh, give a major speech calling for an Israeli president to be removed. Another, yeah. She's duly elected. It's again, someone just to dealing be removed. with the, the sad society of where uh, the Democratic Party yeah, is I right mean, now. I have a, one uh, friend I would say is Democrat, and uh, Jared Boss, which is a congressman from Florida, who's uh, he's just kind of a thorn in the side of Republicans. On he's some of the Fox committees a lot, which probably says a lot. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a funny guy. And, uh, and, and, and he, is, he is funny, and, and, and again, he tries to light up some of the more heavy things on the Congress is taking on. But when it comes to Israel, he's got very strong support. And, uh, you know, he's he's a young guy, so he's in that, even in a minority within a minority of his party. Yeah. And he's got that support. Yeah, let's go ahead and take this call, because it kind of ties in. Elaine in New York, on line one. You're on the air. Yeah. On YouTube. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask why, in fact, the world is so... Um so concerned about the Palestinian people that nobody has offered to take the refugees, take the women, take the children, open the gates to Egypt, even if it's temporarily, just to get rid of the, the terrorists. See, what Elaine, is... I don't know if we can pull the picture that quickly. How secure the border is between Egypt and the Gaza Strip? I mean, it is, Logan, like, it looks, it, it is not even like our southern border. I mean, it's got the walls up, fences up, and, and yeah. literally every two seconds, yeah, we've been there. We've you've got it. you've got met, uh, not like you've got troop movers and yeah. like like that are guns out, ready to go if anybody tries to climb that fence, touch that fence. It's a real border. It's a really it's an armed border uh, with military because they do not trust what the, what a mass movement of migrants from those territories would do inside their own countries. The Jordanians tried it, and a king was killed. So, guess what? They're not going to be a part of this. Uh, so that has been one of the issues, is that uh, those, some of those countries have opened up before historically, and it's been to their detriment. Now, I will say, the reason why internationally you get this support low is that look at the money in the Arab world. The Arab world has got money to throw around. Yeah. Like, like, you know, just like China's doing Look, there's uh, the, U.S., the Arab world. Reason they did actually, during the Abraham Accords and all that, strive for peace. And it may not have been because they were agreeing with Israel all of a sudden politically. It's because the financial it's incentives economic. were absurd. Because all of a sudden you had Israelis able to visit these countries, vacation. You know, you could have a lot. And they're they could very visit, close to each other. They could visit their holy sites uh, that were in Jerusalem. You could do business together. You could, you could fly. I mean, it, yeah, again... There was that hope that, again, that, 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 that the, whole, the U.S. is kind of centered on internationally, which is that if you can economically work together um, and build things together, that you're not going to be uh, enemies. Now, that hasn't necessarily played out in every country. China is a good example of that. But, but in the most part, the Biden administration just didn't even try to continue that. They just went right back to the same theory, which is no peace in the Middle East until the Palestinian question is solved. So we're going to force that back on all these states, and they're going to all have to uh, do the, the policy. You got the picture of the border? Yeah, check it out. That is the, that is what a secure border looks like, and that's the Egyptian border with Gaza Strip. Look at that level. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's what you kind of that's somewhat more than we have a border. Max prison. Yeah, it's pretty intense looking. Double double fencing, tall. So uh, again, when they say all oh, the Israelis, they're not doing anything to help humanitarily. Look at look at Egypt. They're not, they, I mean, nobody's getting across that border if they don't want them to. Uh, not even thinking about it.
the situation that unfolded at uh, the UN Security Council. And this is where the United States uh, took a new move there and they kind of called back to the Obama playbook of allowing something to pass that damages Israel by just saying, we're here, but we're not going to vote. Uh, what's, what's your readout on the abstention vote from the United States yesterday that allowed a ceasefire uh, resolution to pass? Silence is deemed consent. And the fact that the United States abstained as the UN handed this unbelievable victory to Hamas, to its Iranian backers, to those who wish death and destruction on Israel, on the Jews, on America, uh, just tells you exactly what an evil turn this has taken. And I can tell you, from the moment I arrived here in Israel, that's been the conversation ranging from shock and dismay to fury and anger at this betrayal by the Biden administration of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. Admiral Kirby said, because the final text does not have key language we view as essential, notably a condemnation of Hamas, we could not support it. So he's going out on television at a press conference saying we could not support it. But as you said, silence is consent in this manner. Uh, what's your, your response to Admiral Kirby? This is a statement that evil wins, that it's okay to launch a massive, not just terror attack, but a, a terror, it's a war on an innocent nation against innocent men, women, and children. And that the world will back you because the U.S. is in the hands of a feckless administration. And now they're strengthening Hamas, which has always been the dominant force in Palestinian control and power. They're strengthening Hamas as the leadership, ensuring ensuring that if Hamas survives, which they're trying to keep, which America seems to be trying to keep happening, then they will be in control. This is nothing but other than an absolute disaster. This response from the United States and the Biden administration, what I'm concerned about is that by the time we get to election, uh, they're going to be not just abstaining on votes, but they're going to be like voting against Israel at the United Nations. So they've already guard from, from voting against these bad resolutions for Israel, so that was good. But they've got, moved from that to abstaining. And then the likely next move is that you, you are so upset by if Israel continues this, what I believe is justified war, against Hamas until they deliver those hostages and cease their attacks on Israel, uh, that eventually, if uh, you know they don't do this resolution, are you going to actually go and vote yes to start actually condemning Israel? Are you going to join those countries at the United Nations? Is the U.S. going to join in that? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the likely next step if this administration certainly gets another four years in the White House. The reason we, we, you may be joining us right now on YouTube, a lot of you just joined. You may have seen the headline, Jordan, of the you know, our headline right now is exposed. KJP shocking press conference. I think we should restate what happened and what we can do about it. Sure. So at this press conference, uh, Karine Jean-Pierre said, uh, it says after the UN uh, Security Council vote, the U.S., of course, decided to abstain on a vote that uh, called for a ceasefire uh, in the war in Israel and Hamas. This, this was a ceasefire that did not require, um, it does not require any kind of uh, release of hostages, nor does it condemn Hamas for their attacks on October 7th. The entire reason Israel is still engaged in this conflict, which yes, is, uh, of course, is uh, endangering the lives of Palestinians in Gaza because of what happened October 7th. They have to respond as a sovereign nation and they still haven't got all of their hostages back. If Hamas wanted most of this conflict to come to a close, they would get those 100 hostages, whether some are bodies and some are alive, to, the, to, to Israel, and guess what? Palestinian citizens would probably not be facing any more uh, of these air raids, at least for a period of time, if Hamas also stopped firing at Israel. That's all they have to do. But they're unwilling to do that, and they've got the U.N. backing them, saying they can keep hostages, they can keep firing on Israel, but Israel's got to stop. And the U.S. has voted no on that resolution three times because of that. It makes no sense. This top vote, they just abstained, which means it moved forward. So they're very close to making a vote that is actually anti-Israel at the United Nations, going a step further than the, than the Obama and Biden administration. Uh, and they're right, especially, I think, if you give it another four years. And it's because of pe people like AOC. It's, this is 
Even though there's only five or six of these members of Congress that are in Congress slogan elected, this is the base of the Democrat Party right now. They all are echoing her message. Take a listen to her last week on the House floor, fight one. If you want to know what an unfolding genocide looks like, open your eyes. It looks like the forced famine of 1.1 million innocents. We must write our story in this moment of what it means and who we are as Americans. And our story must be not that we were good men who did nothing. You know, first of all, the genocide, or what she's tried to determine as a genocide, the, the, the one point million people she's talking about are not all innocents. They decided to elect a terror group years ago. They've decided to allow that terror group to uh, be part of their families. I mean, within families in the Gaza Strip, maybe there's connections within all of them to, to Hamas. They did that with doctors. They did that with the UN Re Refugee and Relief Agency. And it was like one out of every 10 employees had a direct, was working for Hamas. One, one out of you know 90 percent of employees had a family member as part of Hamas. So she says 1.1 million innocents. I, these are all people who are celebrating their what happened on October 7th. And look, if you don't get to go into a sovereign country, rape, murder, and kill, take hostages, and expect a sovereign country like Israel not to respond, and that response to be pretty darn harsh. I want to say, there's a reason we're still actively working. I'm, I read all the comments, or as many as I can. They go by fast, with thousands of you watch. And there are some people like, well, I'm waiting to know, I'm voting for Trump. It's like, we have to be proactively working right now. Number one, of course, no guarantee President Trump wins. You got to keep going. Number two, the work can't stop because this is people's lives on the lines. I mean, it, a, it, lot, it, a lot of horrible things to Israel could happen between now and, and January. And January. At, at best case scenario. You know, that's just, best uh, case scenario is the U.S. stays, maybe just abstains, but that means these resolutions are going to start moving forward. And Security Council resolutions aren't like General Assembly resolutions. At some point, you could, you could have... Um, you could envision they, they throw in peacekeepers. They've done it before. They did Lebanon. And you know what those peacekeepers do? They help uh, Hezbollah target Israelis. Yeah, and you may not, and, and the U.S. may have a better point of view. I thing in law, in my, in my LN degree in Georgetown, on how the peacekeepers uh, between Israel and Hezbollah on the Lebanese border uh, during one of their last conflicts were literally pointing out for Hezbollah the Israel locations so that Hezbollah could target and kill those Israeli troops. Our executive producer, Will, brought up a good point, was also, which is also, if Trump is to win, then you have a couple months there where it could be an all-out war from the United States on Israel, where they just pull out all the stops, where the Democrats pull out all the stops, right. knowing that the Trump administration is on the way. So it could actually get somewhat more dangerous for Israel and in a high. short term, for a short term. But I just wanted people to know right now that we're, we're still heavily involved in what's happening in Israel. I mean, you know, you've heard from Jeff Balaban, who oversees our office in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, you've known since the October 7th attack, October 7th attacks, what we've done uh, for the hostages. If it's bringing them to Washington, if it's bringing them to Spain, throughout Europe, uh, to bring attention to it, we have. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Speaker of the House is bringing attention uh, to them. Uh, some have been released. Some have, uh, some have lost their lives. A uh, hundred still remain. We do not know. The status, we don't know if all 100 are alive, but we do know about 100 hostages still remain. And yet, at the Security Council at the United Nations, where the U.S. has a permanent seat and also means a veto, and they can veto anything, that means all it takes the U.S. to stop it, there's a resolution that was put forward by the U.S. to call for a ceasefire, but that ceasefire also uh, mentioned that uh, you have to return the hostages both living and dead, and stop the attacks on Israel. And it then Israel would cease, stop the attacks on uh, the Gaza Strip. And the U.S., that was voted down by two permanent members. It was uh, China and Russia. So you'd think the U.S. would not accept their ceasefire resolution, which removed any language condemning Hamas. Load. I mean, think about that. Not even, condemning Hamas, not even condemning Hamas for what they did to people on October 7th. Leave out the rest of the war. Just what they did to children on October 7th and, and, and women and, and the elderly. 
and hostage taking. They would. They, it's not there. You won't find it. Uh, they don't talk about hostages, and yet did the U.S. veto it so it didn't pass because they could have done a veto, and that means that would have killed the resolution. No, they abstained for the first time after three times voting no. They abstained, and Logan, they say, Shereen Jean Pierre is supposed to be a win for us. Shereen Jean Pierre says it's not about politics. As we played that soundbite. It's all about politics because the base of their party has been the younger voter or the, that kind of college campus liberal city voter. And that voter, in this last, I'd say, look, it's since October 7th, has become radicalized in support of the Palestinian movement. Yeah, with, least, like blinders on their eyes to the violence that caused this conflict. Some people think champions are born. That it's a title that requires something only a handful can ever possess. There are times in our lives that we are called, every one of us, to step up and serve a cause greater than ourselves. Even when the loudest voices in the room say it's wrong, then it can't be done. It can be a difficult stand, but it's one any of us can make, including you. You can be the change. You can make that difference. You could be a champion. We cannot yeah. do what we do without you. By becoming a monthly donor, you could become a champion of life. A champion of liberty, a champion of freedom. Please join us. Become an ACLJ champion today. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now, more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Logan Seculo. Welcome back to Seculo. I did tell you we'd come back with some breaking news, Will, and we do have it. Look, there's a lot of scattered reporting right now happening. Uh, again, this at least involves, at a minimum, what's going on in the Middle East, whether Israel is directly involved or not. We don't know. It's not confirmed yet. Let's give a breakdown of what happened uh, just moments ago. So, reports are coming out, and we're reading this from Reuters, from Fox, from many other sources in the region as well, that an airstrike launched at the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, today, on Monday, has killed Mohammad Reza Zahidi. He's a senior commander in Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, and he is also was sanctioned starting in 2010 by the United States Treasury Department, and he was described as a, uh, a player playing a key role in Iran's support for Hezbollah, so their proxy in Lebanon. U.S. Treasury said that he has acted as a liaison to Hezbollah and Syrian intelligence services and was reportedly charging, charged with guaranteeing weapons shipments to Hezbollah from Iran. The reports are that this was an Israeli airstrike. They have been carrying out many airstrikes in, in Syria against Hezbollah and Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps targets, especially in the wake of October 7th, as they try to keep the engagement level with Iran lower than they need, so they don't have a two-front war. But also, Israeli military spokesperson told Reuters that we do not comment on reports in the foreign media. Yeah. So, no confirmation or denial, as is standard practice by Israel when these things happen. But the reports are saying that the consulate building itself in Damascus was leveled. And there are apparently five dead, one of them being this... Uh, an Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps yeah. senior leader. Yeah, so that is the breaking news. As more unfolds, we will go back to it if necessary. If there's any updates, if you're joining us right now. That's it. No, a lot of you are joining us right now. We saw a number spike here about the arrest made on Easter, Easter services. That actually happened on Saturday night at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. We saw pro Palestinian slash pro Hamas protesters uh, disrupt the service. Uh, you can find those clips. We showed them earlier. Uh, but I wanted to make sure if you were joining us, that's what we were discussing. And they were arrested. And good. There are some brave cops out there doing their job. So I have to commend them for, for doing that. These weren't people going in you know, pro peacefully protesting on the sidewalk. These were people interrupting a, a Easter service in the city of New York, a city that has dealt with terror, dealt with a lot of crisis over the last handful of years. Uh, look, some at their own doing, some of what they voted for. 
And sadly, that's just the case. So we want to make sure if you're just joining us right now, that is what that headline was about. Um, let's go ahead and take some phone calls. Let's go to Kathy calling in Kentucky on line two. And if you want to be on the broadcast, 1-800-684-3110. Got three lines open right now. 1-800-684-3110. Welcome, Kathy. Hello. <clears throat> I have a comment. I am so glad that you all reported on, on CC Housework yes. at UN and that you all sent her because our country, which used to be represented by the words, the land of the free and the home of, of the brave, we are seeing our freedoms being questionable all over the place now. And we're no longer a land of the brave. We've given in to, no, Jesus get, yeah, said so. you cannot serve two yeah, gods, both, both God and mammon. And we, our leaders have chosen mammon. Yeah, I think that that's, Kathy, I only cut you off because we only got a minute till break here. I think that you're ex exactly right. I think there are brave people within the ACLJ. There are brave people like you who call in. It may not be in our leadership right now. Look, there's some good people, obviously, uh, on different sides here in terms of what goes on Washington, D.C., but at the top of the top, I think you're right. They're bowing down to what they feel like is what's going to win them an election, not even what they know is true. I honestly think that's why you have a rise in someone like a RFK Jr. You may not like him. You may not agree with him. But I think we can all kind of say, I think he believes what he says. And that's maybe oddly refreshing out of Washington, D.C. That you could support someone, potentially, you don't even agree with just because there's a breath of fresh air in what they're saying. At least you think they believe. That is a big problem here. It's been a big problem in Washington, D.C. for decades. I don't know how to solve that one, but thankfully we have organizations like the ACLJ, people like C.C. Heil, our amazing team here to fight for you. Go to aclj.org. We'll be right back with Dr. Harry Hutchinson. Just a moment. Are saying, you know, but Mr. President, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling, uh, you know, my, my buck isn't going as far. What do you say to those folks about the, uh, the economy and what's going on? Well, I say we have the best economy in the world. We've got to make it better. We really do have the best economy in the world. I don't think I've ever seen it in my 38 years of being here of the economy affecting people the way it is right now. Housing, um, groceries, gas, everything is really impacting people's budgets. Voters tell us what they're paying at the gas pump will definitely influence how they will vote. It is actually hurting our pockets, uh, spending that extra cash. $60 for full tank of gas right now is kind of crazy. One driver who sold his SUV and now shares his compact car with his wife. That was kind of like our, our way of kind of um, just uh, adapting to what's going on right now with the, uh, with the economy and with the gas prices. You know, kind of made a sacrifice. You notice that the economists aren't making much fun of Bidenomics anymore. We're thinking maybe it works to build from the middle out and the bottom up. 65 to 70 pounds of food that these people are receiving, and it's all in response to these rising grocery costs. A lot of people come to us that have never asked for help before, have never needed help before. There's a lot of people that are in absolute panic about how am I going to do this. The president has indicated, and I certainly agree, that getting the cost of living down should be... Uh, number one economic priority. I think voters have decided the cure for inflation is not Biden. What I want Americans to see is how successful um, the president's agenda, which is not just a short-term agenda, but a medium and longer-term agenda. The problem is just getting worse. We're seeing more food pantries open, more uh, more people visiting the food pantries, then the food pantries needing more and more donations and more help. As I said, phone lines are open, 1-800-684-3110. If you're on hold, stay on hold. We'll get to you coming up in the next segment. We are now joined by Senior Counsel and Director of Policy, ACLJ, uh, Harry Hutchinson, to discuss a pretty interesting turn of events. You know, Will, you had President Biden, a day show on Easter, or, or you know, NBC, uh, with Al Roker on Easter, you know, discussing all of the you know, fun festivities and in that. But you, know, you got to give it to Al Roker. He asked a question that maybe was going to make things a bit uncomfortable for President Biden, but no, 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 they have this answer really prepped. Let's hear from first Al Roker, you know him and love him, uh, followed by President Biden. 
When people are saying, you know, but Mr. Carson, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, my, my buck isn't going as far. What do you say to those folks about the, uh, the economy and what's going on? Well, I say we have the best economy in the world. We've got to make it better. We really do have the best economy in the world. You the jobs are, are up more than right? they've ever been. We're in a situation where the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years is maintained. What? But there you have it. The best economy in the world. We've got to make it better. We have to, we have the best economy in the world. Jobs what are up. Kind of Everything is great. Don't, you know, look behind the curtain. Everything is fine here, and I want to clarify, this actually was this morning. I was a little confused because of the Easter Bunny and all of the presents of the Easter things. They held the uh, annual Easter egg roll today on Monday, so that this was the Today Show that was there. I just wanted to clarify that in case you wanted to fact-check me, Facebook. I want to make sure that you knew that I knew that. Um, but how do you respond to that when you hear? It's definitely a prepared, semantical, if you will, if that's a word, argument to say this is the best economy in the world well it's certainly untrue so for instance uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> so he he talks about job growth being up well let's focus on jobs for the moment um it's imperative to note that job growth is not up for american born citizens job growth is actually up for foreign born individuals including illegals so I think the president is somewhat confused. Number two, prices are up by 14% since Biden took office. Uh, and to some extent, that may understate uh, the price increases that people are incurring at the moment because the Bureau of Labor Man. Statistics, when it calculates inflation, I it focuses on it. rental prices, Flush not home toilet. ownership data. And home ownership costs have gone up for some Americans by a factor of 80%. Uh, and so if you're looking at your own mortgage payments, go vis-a-vis what you might outside. have paid in 2019, uh, the prices have gone through the roof. Uh, in addiction, gasoline prices Jeez. are up in part because the United States is supporting a war between Ukraine and Russia, and both countries are destroying energy reserves uh, as part of their war effort. So that is uh, sending uh, gasoline prices up. So one of the things that most Americans should focus on, in my opinion, is that native-born employment is a whopping 5.5 million below its pre-pandemic trend. Now I grant you that's a trend, right. but it's actually 121,000 less uh, than uh, before the pandemic. So many Americans are hurting, and most of the job growth, to finish the story, yeah. is in part-time employment. So I want you to take that statement from Professor Hutchinson here and memorize it. Because when you are at a dinner party or you have your family over, your more liberal friends who are going to regurgitate, oh, we have the best economy ever, and um, yada, it's facts. I want you to go back. We just provided you with an extensive reason why that is simply, well, untrue. Well, and it makes you wonder if, if the Democrats get away with this, with this talking point, is their new MO going to be, let's just shut down the economy entirely, then we can get record job growth when we open it back up. Because that's kind of what he's implying here. And, and you make an incredibly valid point, Will, because a lot of the so-called job growth is simply a recovery of jobs that were lost during the pandemic. Right. And so Biden wants to take credit for that. Uh, in addition, it's important uh, to keep in mind uh, that there has not been a growth in high-paying full-time jobs paying full benefits. Mm. And so most people, even if they are newly employed, employed, they are not feeling better about themselves and justifiably yeah, so. It's job. sort of the, the old school politics, which is blame the previous administration for anything that uh, is going wrong, and then try to take credit for things that, you know, really, you don't have... You don't have the credit you can take. So it, it feels pretty normal, weirdly, in politics for this to be the case. Um, it is a, a ridiculous statement to, to feel that way. No one feels that way. No one feels like we're living in the best economy of all time. All of us have seen our bills go up. Everyone has seen all food prices go up. Uh, again, 
you have decisions being made by families who probably never would have thought of, do I need to uh, get this pizza delivered, or do I need to go pick it up? I mean, legitimately, those kind of decisions Three are having out. to be made. As you go, yeah. well, they're going to charge me this, and then there's going to be a service fee, and then, you know, I'm going to have to pin $20 on a tip, and then all of a sudden, my $40 to feed my family tonight just went to $80, $85, and I'm sorry, it's no longer about convenience, about saving, you know, as much money as you can when things are increasing and increasing you know, every day it feels like the prices are going up. To so to sit, and the economy is not the best place it's ever been. Uh, it's just moving around numbers. Uh, well, and to your point as well, California just started today, as we're on air, a new minimum wage for fast food workers. Saw that. It's twenty dollars an hour to work Whoa. in fast food. These weren't supposed to be career jobs. I mean, right. supposed to be management. You know, and, and and right, but to that point. I still don't know that that's a livable wage, yeah. making $20 an hour working at a fast food restaurant. But yet, that's this is a reactionary used to be. type move because of how expensive, Minimum how debt-laden our economy an is. Hour, and ago. I don't know that the workers in California are necessarily going to be super thrilled about this move. Maybe they are because there's some reprieve. But the fact that they have to mandate... A 20, which uh, you can go, get into the whole discussion, Professor Harry Hutchison, about minimum wage law. But the fact of the matter that they felt compelled that it had to get to this point should be a better barometer of the economy than what the President of the United States is saying. Precisely. So, number one, with the increase in minimum wages in California and in other states, I might add, uh, this should lead to layoffs. But number two... Fast food chains are going to face a double whammy because oh, lower income individuals are already spending less at fast food boom. chains. Uh, yeah, so fill in up. the names of McDonald's, Burger King, uh, Five Guys. Big Their Mac prices have gone up bucks. and low in in income individuals are actually spending less. So this should fuel job declines, at least in some of those industries going forward. And then there's a second hit that's out there, which is the roaring national debt, which has gone up very fast under uh, uh, Joe Biden. And at some point, the interest payable on that debt will go up. And what does that fuel? It fuels, arguably in the long term, more inflation and more pain for average Americans. So I think part of the problem with Joe Biden is Joe Biden is a wealthy individual who is disconnected from the American people, from average working class and middle class Americans, and he keeps making these statements uh, which make little sense. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, for, for coming in here and really helping educate our listeners and me and Will and really understand the really the vast uh, spin that can be taken when it comes to the way politics works. When you know the facts and when you see what they are, it's very clear. And, and uh, look, again, like I said, go back and replay that. Listen to it. Take it in. Because you're going to have to be able to defend yourself uh, when you're having these discussions over the next six months or so as we head to a season. presidential election. What are we, eight months out? Less than eight days. Months. Less than eight, eight months. months. November 5th is when we go to the polls. Yeah, so... Um, it's going to come fast, and there's going to be a lot you're going to have to defend yourself of why you're choosing to either vote or not vote for the current president or a third party for President Trump. Uh, make sure you, you get those facts and listen to, to what yeah. we broadcast here. I also encourage you, we got a minute left here until we head to our final segment of the day. I would love to have a full bank of calls. Just spend the rest of the day hearing from you. Because thousands of you are watching right now, and there's three lines open. I want to hear from you. Right now, I want your point of view, oh, as someone who supports the work of the ABCLJ, as obviously someone power, who man. listens to this broadcast, or listening on radio, or watches it on YouTube or Rumble every day, I want to hear from you. Now is the time to open up those lines on any of the discussions we had today, whether that was Israel, whether that is the economy. Do you feel like, I know a lot of you have been around longer than me who are listening right now, do you feel like we're living in the best economy of all time right now? Best economy in the world? Give me a call, 1-800-684-3110. Just want to spend the next segment hearing from you. Go to aclj.org, support the work of the ACLJ. Again, a special thank you to all of you that support us during that Life and Liberty Drive in the month of March. 
broke records, and it's really amazing. And then we are so, so thankful to God and to you for doing that. We'll be right back with your voice. You can't even hire a punching bag anymore if you are <laughs> on the left. You can't even hire someone on the other side uh, to essentially say the things you know that will fire up your viewers because that, just to have someone on the other side, that's just unacceptable. This comes from Chuck Todd, who, by the way, is one of the ones that pretends to not have that bias. Right. One of the ones that, you know, meet the press, try to be the straight newsman that's always, you know, you give it to you, give you the facts and not give it his opinions. Let's hear from Chuck Todd. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. Well, I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting. Rhonda McDaniel, who, by the way, hasn't necessarily been uh, the favorite of a lot of people for quite some time. But that's even just the concept of having a Republican to look at. They couldn't apply that standard to every single person on NBC staff. Specifically, Jen Psaki, who has a show on MFNBC called Inside with Jen Psaki. I don't know how many people watch it, but it's there if you want to check it out. But she was, right before that job, President Biden's White House spokesperson. I've watched NBC and MSNBC for a couple of hours uh, pretty much every week. I try to look and see what they're saying. They don't have dissenting voices on. To go on, even if you're a Republican that goes on, you have to hate Trump and you have to say that Joe Biden is the better choice. Um, so there's no dissent. There's no debate. Welcome back to Secular. We'll be taking your calls, by the way. And so stay on hold if you are on hold right now. We'll get to you a bit later in the show. Or you can call in at 1-800-684-3110. We are joined by Jeff Balaban, live from Israel. Will, and there has been some updates. We wanted to get some reaction from Jeff. That's right, and uh, Jeff, you and I had been talking yesterday right. as you were back en route to Israel about the situation that unfolded at uh, the UN Security Council, and this is where the United States uh, took a new move there, and they kind of called back to the Obama playbook of allowing something to pass that damages Israel by just saying, we're here, but we're not going to vote. Uh, what's, what's your readout on the abstention vote from the United States yesterday that allowed a ceasefire uh, resolution to pass the U.N. Security Council? Well, you know what they say. Silence is deemed consent. And the fact that the United States abstained as the U.N. handed this unbelievable victory to Hamas, to its Iranian backers, to those who wish death and destruction on Israel, on the Jews, God on America, uh, just tells you exactly where an evil Israel. turn this has taken. And I can tell you, from First the moment I arrived here in Israel, that's been the conversation Church. ranging from shock and dismay to fury and anger at this betrayal by the Biden administration of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And I want to get your take on this, because this is, uh, I'm going to read you what Admiral Kirby said. Uh, as they try to spin that they were not supporting this measure because they abstained. And then I kind of want to push back on this because that's what we do at the ACLJ. We point out the hypocrisy or the anti-Semitism or any other manner of anti-Israel action that goes on with this government. But Admiral Kirby said, because the final text does not have key language we view as essential, notably a condemnation of Hamas, we could not support it. So he's going out on television at a press conference saying we could not support it. But as you said, silence is consent in this manner. Uh, what's your, your response to Admiral Kirby? We know that there have been other administrations, and not just Republican administrations. There were some spectacular administrations at the U.N. who had our ambassadors to the U.N. who represented America as a light to the nations, a light to the world, as opposed to just adding to the darkness, which is what's happened here, to turning our lights out. 
No, the truth is that this was a statement of pure evil. This is a statement that evil wins, that it's okay to launch a massive, not just terror attack, but a, a terror, it's a war on an innocent nation against innocent men, women, and children, and that the world will back you because the U.S. is in the hands of a feckless administration that, as we all know, because what I find fascinating is that the media re reports this widely, and nobody even seems to understand, no one contradicts it, understands the morality that's implied here, which is that everyone talks about the, quote, two-state solution, Michigan and Minnesota, because obviously Democrats want to keep those two states, which are important swing states, which have heavy anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, Muslim um, communities and yeah, voters. So. Not to say that all Muslim communities and voters are anti-Semitic, but the ones in Michigan and Minnesota certainly are. And, uh, and it's clear that for this domestic concern, they're throwing Israel under the bus. Let me tell you, America should not be following. America should be leading. They should be down there remonstrating against the evil of this idea of calling for a ceasefire, which is to say Hamas wins, uh, terror wins. Sure. But you know, it's completely consistent with what this administration has done since the beginning, which, which used this, their... this horrible attack oh, on Jewish civilians, on no Israeli no innocents, to call for the creation of a Palestinian state. And now they're strengthening Hamas, which has always been the dominant force in Palestinian feud. control and power. They're strengthening Hamas as the leadership, ensuring, ensuring that if Hamas survives, which they're trying to keep, which it, America it seems to be trying to keep happening, then they will be in control. This is nothing but other than an absolute disaster. Jeff, I just was curious, from a humanitarian point of view even, I think we're seeing so much, and, and on the media when they're covering Israel, we're seeing Gaza, we're seeing... Uh, destruction, we're seeing all that kind of chaos that surrounds it. What is the and, and life during wartime in Israel? I just want to know what's the feeling, the emotion on the streets at this point? We are months into this. It's not like you know the days where every business is shut down and they're trying to figure out what to do. We're now six months into this. Uh, plus, at this point, what does it feel like to be there? I've only been there during you know, obviously, there's always times of struggle in Israel, there's always times of, of you gotta always be safe and be aware, but you, you can. Not put your guard down, but it doesn't feel like an unsafe place to be just walking around. Uh, obviously, we know the anti-Israel sentiment that's happening even in our college campuses here. We had a, in Vanderbilt here, we had an issue yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about there on the ground? Because we're not seeing regular Israeli life by any means being portrayed uh, in the media. It's a great question, Logan. And it's very difficult to answer unless someone's actually here. Because on the one hand, everything has changed. Nothing is normal. There's not a family here that hasn't lost somebody close to them. There's not a family here or, or who hasn't had someone serve for months in horrific danger and therefore is, is agonizing every moment of the day about their father, their mother, their brother, their sister, their child, their parent. It's an ongoing trauma. The, the, the trauma of the hostages is an ongoing trauma. It's a very small nation. It's a nation that feels much more like a family. And so there is trauma, and yet, life does go on. And so part of the problem is that the people in this country have learned how to live with a certain level of violence and terror. And, and yet, what's extraordinary is, and I wonder what will happen this year, you know, every year, year after year, they do a poll internationally. I, I forget under whose auspices of the happiest countries in the world. Israel is always in the top ten. Both the Jews and the Arabs are always in the top ten of happiness. And happiness is not related to your danger. It's not related to your physical comfort. Happiness is related, I believe, to being a sense of, of living a life that's connected to what you're supposed to be doing. And I think everyone who lives here recognizes that it's important. The Jews have come back to our homeland, and it's important to, to just, co just, just to exist and forge ahead. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you hopping on today uh, live from Israel. You're running our office in Israel, the ACLJ Jerusalem. We couldn't be more proud to have that set up there, and uh, hopefully that expands and grows uh, as our as support for, continues from a lot of people here. You know, you, you'll see the press, and you'll you'll feel like everyone in America is now on one side of this issue. We all know that it's a very divided country, and sadly, this has become one of those topics that felt like it didn't used to be divided, but now uh, you're seeing a coalition of, of folks that maybe you never thought would in support of Israel, and then of course those who are against it. We appreciate you, Jeff, for coming on. I did want to tell you as we head into the next segment, we are going to hear Will in the next segment from CeCe Heil, who is currently right. 
uh, supporting Israel at the UN. And this morning, uh, for us, because it's evening obviously in Geneva, she delivered an oral intervention uh, in defense of Israel. So our team has the courage to go to Geneva in the hostile environment that is the United Nations and deliver a message, an oral intervention in defense of Israel. And you're going to hear that. And tomorrow we'll play uh, a defense that she gave in an appeal, really, to the Human Rights Council. That is going to do it for today's broadcast. Again, support the work of the ACLJ. My last call today for you to become an ACLJ. I'm going to say today, become an ACLJ champion. That is a monthly supporter. Will, did we have a number that we hit, that we need to hit to hit that stretch goal? Yeah, we need... Give me one second. One second. We're 25 seconds. You find us that number, Will. I know it's under 150 to hit that stretch goal. Our help. So under 150 111. people. 111. 111. That's a big help. move in the last few minutes here. 111. Wow, There's a lot more of you watching right now just on Rumble and just on YouTube. Become an ACLJ champion. That is a monthly supporter at any 000. level that you feel comfortable with. Of course, you can cancel any time. Hey, ACLJ. Talk to you tomorrow. If you can't afford 20 bucks a month, get your cable shut off.